I'm Emily Chang and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, Apple's most advanced handset hits stores next week, but the success of the iPhone X could rise and fall on its ambitious key feature. Will the new facial recognition technology set the gold standard for the industry? We will explore. Plus, Amazon gets a spare key. The online giant is rolling out a new delivery feature that lets couriers in, even when there's nobody home. We'll discuss. And a new price system in the pipeline to better navigate the highs and lows of the U.S. box office. How Regal Entertainment plans to rip the script on how viewers pay. First, to our lead. Interest continues to grow over the iPhone 10 as the countdown to its November 3rd release begins. This is one of the most ambitious devices Apple has ever brought to market. The technology posed several challenges, however, for Apple from facial recognition to 3D sensors. Bloomberg Tech's Alex Webb has been covering what's going on behind closed doors at Apple and whether the tech giant will be ready to get the iPhone in the hands of consumers next week. Alex Webb joins us now along with Crawford Del Pret, IDC Chief Research Officer. So Alex, you have a new story out today. Day, uh, where the main headline seems to be that Apple, at least from where it started with the facial recognition technology, decided to downgrade that technology in order to produce it at a mass scale. Please clarify what I just said. So what we're talking about here is a technology which previously was only in the Microsoft Connect, which was you know the size of a kind of a large hardback book. They've reduced this down to the size a few centimeters across and a few millimeters deep. The realm, the realm of error, the margin of error in that is tiny. And in order then to make it possible for their suppliers and their component makers and module assemblers, people who take components and build them into a package, which are then ship to the Foxcons of the world, they had to reduce some of the specifications in order to make it possible to ship it in the quantities they needed. So what does this actually mean? Well, I mean, from a consumer... Is the technology going to be any different than advertised? From a consumer perspective, I don't think anybody will be able to tell any difference, frankly. You know, the difference they were talking about for the Touch ID, one in 50,000 people could spoof your fingerprint. For Face ID, they're saying it's one in a million. Now, I have no idea whether, unfortunately, from our sourcing, they cut some of these um, specs before or after they released that one, million, one in a million figure. But the likelihood is it's still going to be infinitely better than Touch ID. Now, Apple's statement on your reporting. Bloomberg's claim that it reduced the accuracy spec for Face ID is completely false, and we expect Face ID to be the new gold standard for facial authentication. The quality and accuracy of Face ID haven't changed. It continues to be one in a million probability of a random person unlocking your iPhone with Face ID. I mean, it speaks to what I said before. You know, that perhaps suggests that it might have happened before they released that that um, that number. But you know, we stand by our reporting. We've got very good confidence in the people we spoke to, and they're very close to what's been going on. Crawford, what do you make of this? Yeah, I think that this is about the tolerance of where Apple potentially started versus what they're going to live up to when they ship. And the fact of the matter is, as Alex says, if they live up to that one in a million, then they then they, they haven't reduced it, and the consumer will never know. Um, if there's a reliability problem, if people experience you know situations in low light, um, in uh, ways that you know doesn't necessarily recognize it, then that would be an issue. We don't believe that will be the case. Apple is clearly coming out and saying that they're standing by but behind this technology. We have said we think there'll be somewhere between three and four million devices at launch. We're standing behind that number. We think it's going to be, we have no reason to believe it won't be a successful launch. Alex, walk us through how facial recognition technology, Apple's facial recognition technology is expected to work. So there are fundamentally three components here that matter. There's what they call the flood illuminator, which is much like a torch. <coughs> it flashes around and sees, oh, there's a face. Now, it then Palms passes on the action to what they call the, the dot projector, which is very computationally intense. They do not want it to be on the whole time. This flashes 30,000 dots at your face. The infrared camera then detects that, puts it through their algorithms and recognizes this is the person who is, I should allow or should not allow to unlock the phone. So Crawford, how difficult would you say is it to manufacture this kind of technology at scale? 
Uh, it's very difficult to manufacture a scale. These are, these are precision products, and we've heard a lot of um, rumor and innuendo that yield has been a problem. I mean, there have been manufacturing yield numbers thrown out of 60% of 50%. Those are, those are really unacceptable when you think about a high volume manufactured product. Those yields have to come up to the 90, 80, 70, even 70% uh, over time. And I think that they will get better, but this is a very, very expensive product. This product has a premium price point, um, and there is gonna be fall out around some of those components we, we've definitely seen that in the supply chain are there any other components that are causing potential issues well we've reported going back a year that there were constraints in OLED it seems as though they've broken the back of that I think the, the flood projector as well this other infrared laser they had some issues with that we we had from our sources <coughs> the yield actually on the dot projector alone was about 20 percent at one yeah, stage just... and for the flood illuminator was about 40 percent now it's above 50 for both of those but it's still a long way from the 90 percent which yeah. they're comfortable with yeah so I mean they so so again Again, I, I would just say that um, you know we, we believe that um, Apple will ship optimistically somewhere, say, 37 million iPhone Xs in Q4. We're now feeling that that's at the very high end, not only based on uh, the components we're talking about today, uh, but also based on OLED availability. I mean, don't forget, Samsung has the absolute lion's share of these screens locked up, and they take a significant amount themselves. So OLED, we're not willing to say, is not going to be a constraint going forward and certainly going into next year. Uh, that's shipping. What about demand? Are you expecting demand to, you know, there, be, be, be higher than uh, ever um, despite um, this $1,000 yeah. price tag? Our expectation is that there will be unsatisfied demand in Q4. Mm -hmm. This is going to be a very, very hot product when people uh, are you know, lining up for it, trying to get it. They, they will not be able to meet initial demand in Q4, we don't believe. I think one thing also to take away from our story, we go into very great depth. This is one detail of the story, which obviously Apple hasn't been very happy with, but we go into very great depth about the supply chain. And I think the big takeaway is they have broken the back of a lot of the problems they had with the 3D sensors. This was one of the ways they did it. There are other ways as well. Please read our story. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Crawford. So, you know, what do you expect? Uh, Pre-order start on Friday. Yep. You can go to the store and buy it the following Friday. Yeah. If you stand in line, yeah. uh, presumably, but, but but how do you expect uh, the 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 demand and supply curve to unfold? <clears throat> um, I think that they are going to be fairly supply constrained. As we said, our expectation is somewhere around four million at launch. They probably ship somewhere optimistically uh, thirty-seven million, probably more realistically somewhere in the thirty million mm -hmm. range for Q4. Uh, and then our expectation is, um, as you get out um, I I I I into next year, um, you know, we're looking at. Um, you know, 50% of their phones will be high end. We're looking at about 240 million units next year. Not all iPhone X, that's all, all iPhones in general. Half of those will be the larger size of which iPhone X will be included. And what are you seeing with the iPhone 8? Um, iPhone 8 demand is, uh, our expectation is, is pretty strong. Our expectation for this quarter, about 15 million uh, right. units shipped. I, I think one interesting idea will be the fact it'll be important to have the iPhone 10 in stores because I think there probably are a lot of iPhone 8 buyers who are waiting to hold the two side by side and say, do I really want to spend $300 more on this? And if they don't, they'll buy the iPhone 8. Mm. Yeah, All that's right. a great point. Uh, Alex Webb, our Bloomberg Tech reporter, thanks so much. Crawford Gel Pratt of IDC, always great to have you here on the show. Thank you both. Thank you. Well, Twitter, Facebook, and Google might be appearing on Capitol Hill a little earlier than planned. The three have been invited to a Senate hearing on Tuesday. The Senate Committee on the Judiciary Subcommittee on Crime and Terrorism wants to discuss Russian election interference and the use of the company's platforms by extremist groups. Top lawyers will be appearing on the Hill the day after to publicly testify about Russian meddling in the 2016 U.S. elections. Coming up, Tom Layton, the CEO of Akamai Technologies, joins Bloomberg to discuss his company's big earnings beat. And Bloomberg Tech is live streaming on Twitter, of course. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV. Weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. A stock we are watching, Advanced Micro Devices, plugged more than, plunged more than 13% in the session, its worst performance in five months. Shares are under pressure after the company reported fourth quarter revenue may drop as much as 15% from the previous quarter. Meantime, the company reported both profit and sales beat estimates in the current quarter. 
Turning now to a bright spotlight in today's mixed bag of earnings, Akamai Technologies, the company, a provider of content delivery and cloud security services, posted earnings and revenue that topped estimates, thanks in part to strong video traffic from large customers. Tom Layton, the CEO of Akamai Technologies, expanded on the company's performance earlier on Bloomberg Television. Yeah, I think so. Uh, you know, people are watching a lot more video online and at higher quality levels. And as much as that's happening, it's really the tip of the iceberg. Uh, you know, we gave an example on the call of, uh, you know, we had 60 terabits per second last quarter. And well, what is that? That's 12 million people watching it reasonable quality levels mm. and you can imagine a future world with a hundred million a billion people watching maybe even at high quality so a lot of runway left there I think I was looking at some of the analyst notes uh, following your results and B Riley boosted its price target to seventy dollars and the analyst there said quarterly execution was stellar what is it about the current industry environment that things are coming together right now for you well in addition to media and video of course there's a lot of interest in cybersecurity mm -hmm. uh, and you just you look at the headlines every week of the, the latest disaster and that's where we have really compelling solutions so that business for us now is half a billion dollars a year in revenue and growing in the high 20 percent and we just you know unveiled our latest technology to use machine learning to differentiate between bots and humans you know humans when they hold a, a mobile phone and are tapping have a much different kind of dynamic than a bot would coming in to try to steal your identity or hack into an account to steal your money mm -hmm. um, and then on the enterprise side you know the old notion that you have a perimeter you know the corporate firewall like the moat around the castle just doesn't hold anymore uh, and what does it look like now well we're in a world now where it should be zero trust you can't trust anybody even your employees because they're getting infected you know they take their devices and they go to websites so they click on the wrong link get infections and then they come in they inside import they import it and once you know behind the firewall or you're in the corporate perimeter now it runs wild and you get these big data breaches well you mentioned expansion of products what other new products are you looking at and will those be big uh, growth drivers next year as well yeah I think so you know managing the bots and there's all different kinds of bots a lot of them bad uh, but not all is a you know very fast growing product area for us uh, stopping the account takeovers is important stopping enterprise employees from getting infected even if they do click on that bad link you know so we have new products and market there that I think will sustain a lot of growth for our cloud security business and on the media side not only is there more traffic, you know, because more people are watching, but we just unveiled our new technology where over the top is a head of satellite. You know, typically if you watched online, you'd be 10 to 90 seconds behind satellite. Right. You know, and so the, the touchdown had taken place and then a minute later you're seeing it. Now we actually beat the satellite, which is very cool. That is a good development uh, from where you stand, certainly. I want to change topics a bit here because I was noticing that you're one of the 18 CEOs who was invited to the White House this year. Uh, you had also served on President Bush, George W. Bush's Information Technology Advisory Committee as well. What do you see in terms of a follow through, a continuation of commitment in modernizing and securitizing uh, government in IT infrastructure? Has that been, a, has that been consistent? Is there a follow through? Well, you know, I think the major tech companies really want to help the government modernize IT and better protect themselves. So we do a lot of work in Washington uh, to help the government. And irrespective of administration, that's really important to do. And sticking with this topic, executives from Facebook and Google and Twitter will be testifying on Capitol Hill next week on the probe into Russian intervention. What would you want to hear come out of that? Well, you know, obviously a very serious concern. These are very unusual times. Uh, you know, we want to be sure the Internet is used for good and not to, you know, do bad things. Privacy is another major issue right now. How do you balance, you know, the law enforcement's need with the, the need for the citizens to have privacy? And, and tech's right in the middle of it. And it's hard, you know, for the laws to keep up because yeah. tech is moving so fast. Mm -hmm. Do you think we should consider these companies a kind of public utility, as some have suggested? 
Oh, it, it's very different than a normal public utility. These are obviously very large, very capable, very powerful companies mm -hmm. providing a lot of great services. Uh, and it's just now we're in the middle of some of these issues around, you know, potentially things to do with the election being influenced by social media or manipulated news. Uh, it's really amazing what's happened over the last decade. That was Tom Layton, CEO of Akamai Technology, speaking earlier on Bloomberg Television. Coming up, will a new pricing strategy incentivize moviegoers? We will dig into Regal Cinema's latest test. And a feature I want to bring to your attention, our interactive TV function. Check it out at TV Go, right on the Bloomberg. You can watch us live. If you miss an interview, you can go back to it. You can send our producers a message, play along with the charts we show you on air. This is for Bloomberg subscribers only. You can check it out at TV Go. This is Bloomberg. T-Mobile is winning over mobile phone customers with giveaways. The company added more than 6,000 subscribers in the third quarter. Now it's twice as many as Sprint. It added less than 300,000. T-Mobile is the champion of charitable commerce, giving away perks like Lyft rides, Dunkin' Donuts products, and Netflix services to all subscribers. Well, Regal Entertainment Group is testing demand-based pricing for tickets, potentially leading to higher prices for top hits and low prices for flops. Now, this would be a major shift for an industry that typically uses a one-size-fits-all approach. The company is working with app maker Adam Tickets, which has lobbied theaters to try dynamic pricing. Joining me now from L.A., our Bloomberg News reporter, Anusha Sakui. So, Anusha, first of all, explain why they're doing this. Well, you know... What's said quite frequently about the theatre industry is that you know innovation really hasn't come to it, and uh, this is really probably one of the, the more conservative, I would say, chains taking uh, the bull by the horns and addressing um, a sort of issue that, that, that the industry is facing right now, which is um, a very low turnout at the box office and struggling uh, in terms of uh, revenue this year. And especially over the summer, it was very disappointing. And, you know, that's reflected in their share price. You know, AMC and Regal, the two leaders, have both seen their share prices uh, fall quite considerably this year. So... Uh would this actually mean that if you go to a movie that's popular or good, the price would be higher, and a movie that's doing not so well, the price would be lower? So we don't know yet what the parameters are. And, you know, when I've reached out to Regal for more details, uh, you know, they, they sort of sneaked this out on, on a call yesterday with analysts. Um, they, they've, they're quite reticent to give uh, too much detail about how exactly they're going to do this. What's clear is that they want to make more money in quiet times uh, and, and busy times and to use something like Atom Tickets, which uh, allows, you know, you to... Uh, you know, make group bookings, make it easier for you to be more opportunistic when you want to go to the movies um, and, and to work together to try and uh, find some kind of trend in pricing that will help that and to be flexible in pricing. The interesting thing is that studios really don't want, by and large, to have a price put on a movie that indicates maybe it's not very good. So it's sort of like a fine line that they're going to have to, um, you know, tread around so, you know, that they can maybe charge more in, in what they expect to be busy periods, but not necessarily charge less for films that people don't like. So well, it's going exactly. uh, to be a tricky one. How do we expect studios to react to this? 
Yeah, when, when I've spoken to executives, you know, uh, in private, these, I mean, these are very tense conversations. As the movie industry is at a critical juncture and uh, the cinema and exhibitors are under pressure, as are movie studios, um, to address the rising threat of, of Netflix and Amazon and streaming in general and people not going to movies. So um, they are very sensitive conversations, but what I've been hearing is that you know, studios generally don't want um, that, that, you know, that kind of dynamic pricing or commoditization of movies. But at the same time, you know, theatres have to have to find some way of, uh, of addressing, you know, the lack of attendance. So, you know, some something probably in the middle will, will happen. And also, um, analysts pointed out that earlier this year, AMC had sort of suggested something similar in terms of dynamic pricing. And in many other industries, it's commonplace uh, in terms yeah. of entertainment, live music, sports. You've also got a startup like MoviePass that's got this controversial once a month yep. uh, $10 fee to see a movie every day, if you like. Do we know how um, that experiment is working? Well, I mean, we know it's very popular. They just um, upgraded the, the expectations for their subscriber count and, uh, um, you know, increased the, the, the public um, uh, d filings around how many subscribers they've got now, 600,000. Whether or not that's going to end up being a business that works, we'll have to wait and see, but definitely there's demand for it. And yes, as you said, that is a major threat. The other major threat that we've been reporting on is something called premium video on demand, which is basically the movie studio saying, look, people want movies at home soon and so they're trying to pressure theatres uh, to release um, their new movies and, and reduce the exclusivity period that is typically given to theatres and let them show them at home sooner so they can make some more money. So there's a lot of different pressures there and a lot of sort of delicate negotiations going on around and testing uh, what's possible. All right, Anusha Sakua reporting for us in Hollywood. Anusha, as always, thanks so much for joining us. Coming up, a prominent venture capital firm in Silicon Valley is investigating if one of its founding partners is guilty of misconduct. We will have that story next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. I'm Mark Crumpton in New York. You're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's begin with a check of first word news. President Trump has described as sad reporting that says Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign and the Democratic National Committee helped pay for political research that ultimately produced a dossier about Mr. Trump's alleged ties to Russia. I understand they paid a tremendous amount of money and Hillary Clinton always denied it. The Democrats always denied it. And now only because it's going to come out in a court case, they said, yes, they did it. They admitted it. With a little more than four months to go until Russia's presidential election, Vladimir Putin is still to announce if he'll run for a fourth term. So far, no candidate has emerged as a major rival or frontrunner. Putin is expected to wait until December to reveal his intentions. The prime minister of Singapore suggested today the U.S. lost some credibility in canceling the Trans-Pacific Partnership. The strategic dividend goes beyond the participants in the TPP. It is a way to link both sides of the Pacific and to strengthen the considerable rationale which already exists for America to be focused and engaged in the region. The TPP agreement among 12 nations was the largest in history. Brazil's President Michel Temer has been hospitalized. His office says he's suffering from urological problems. Brazil's lower house was scheduled to vote today on whether Temer should stand trial on corruption charges. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. It's just after 5.30 p.m. here in New York, 8.30 Thursday morning in Sydney. My colleague Paul Allen has a look at the markets. Paul, good morning.
Good morning, Mark. Uh, looks like a bit of a down day on the markets for this Thursday. New Zealand already trading and off about a tenth of 1% right now uh, following that uh, weaker lead from the US. We've also got Brent crude flat and uh, WTI down six tenths of 1%. Uh, we've got Nikkei futures looking about two tenths of a percent weaker. The same story here in Australia with ASX futures also off two tenths of 1%. We've just had uh, some breaking news in the past uh, few minutes. Uh, ANZ out with full year earnings. This is one of the big four Australian banks. Full year cash profit up 18% to $6.9 billion in line with estimates. A return on equity rising to 12% almost in the net interest margin just slipping a little to 1.99%. Full year dividend there 80 cents. The Aussie dollar also weaker around 77 cents following Wednesday's very weak CPI data. I'm Paul Allen in Sydney. More from Bloomberg Technology next. One of Silicon Valley's top investors is being investigated for potential misconduct. Venture capital firm Draper Fisher Jurvetson said it is investigating founding partner Steve Jurvetson, who sits on the board of both Tesla and SpaceX. The news comes days after entrepreneur Kerry Krukel called out the firm on Facebook, saying, quote, women approached by founding partners of Draper Fisher Jurvetson should be careful. Predatory behavior is rampant. The modes are varied. Silencing behavior ranges from security within the firm, creating files on women to potential violations of revenge porn laws to grotesque threats. I will not set foot in Silicon Valley for investment. Joining me now to discuss Ellen Hewitt, who's covering this story for Bloomberg. So we'll say at the outset, there aren't many details, but what do we know? We know basically what the company, or sorry, the firm has confirmed to us and to other outlets, which is that sometime over the summer, they hired a law firm to look into allegations of potential misconduct against Steve Jervison, who's one of its founding partners. And, and we really don't know much more than that. We don't know sort of how long it's been going on or the degree to which um, you know, it was involved in firm stuff or whether it was you know, within the firm or between um, Mr. Jervison and maybe potential um, entrepreneurs and, and that kind of thing. So uh, Carrie Kukul made the statement on Facebook. Uh, she also said, the situation I found myself in is personally atypical and I've not been in any other situation remotely like that. I was not seeking investment or trying to further my career. We understand that she and Jervison were involved in some sort of personal relationship. Uh, she also said that after she wrote that post that she was contacted by the attorneys who are working on this investigation. Uh, tell us a little bit more about Steve Jervison. We know he's on the board of Tesla. We know he's on the board uh, of SpaceX. Um, we know he's quite charismatic. He's been on the show before. Yeah, he's a really well-known investor in Silicon Valley. And he has a particular interest in space in sort of fringe technologies. And yeah, obviously has a very close business relationship with Elon Musk through Tesla, through SpaceX. But you know, he's also also a personal friend of his. He's just, he's one of these people who's very much in the orbit of some of the top entrepreneurs, top CEOs, top investors of Silicon Valley. So it's, it's really a, a big name. He, um, he invested in Hotmail in the early days. I right. believe that Draper Fisher Jurvetson is the firm that really threw Tesla a lifeline in, in the early days when Tesla couldn't raise uh, money. Um, of course, this is just the series, the, 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 the latest in a series of scandals across Silicon Valley involving venture capital firms, tech companies, um, Justin Kaldbeck, Dave McClure, Chris Saka, uh, Travis Kalanick ha ha has resigned amidst uh, these issues around sexual harassment. You know, talk to us a little bit about the climate right now. Yeah, I think the climate is a time unlike another time we've seen. I mean, there are allegations about this kind of stuff coming out, a lot of them about recent behavior, but sometimes older. I think there's a sense that really women feel much more emboldened to speak up and say, hey, you know, I experienced this behavior and I, it, it was wrong. And the way to get attention to this behavior and to try to stop it from happening in the future is, and to hold people accountable, is to name names, to come on the record, to, to say these kinds of things. And I think the example that you brought up with this woman, this entrepreneur, who said that she had had sort of this gray area, personal experience with um, Steve Jurvetson, also underlines just how fluid some of the lines are between investors and entrepreneurs in the Valley. You're not working together maybe until there's an investment, but there's a lot of networking, getting to know people, and you meet, and it's sort of business, but sometimes 
sometimes it's personal and and there aren't these hierarchies um, that we're used to within the workplace where it's pretty clear that you know um, managers should not date people who are their direct reports and and there shouldn't be relationships like that but it's less clear I think in this world between investors and entrepreneurs to reiterate the statement coming from Jaber Fisher Jurvetson itself, Carol Wentworth, a spokeswoman for DFJ, uh, said the firm hired a law firm in the summer after hearing indirectly of allegations about Jurvetson. The process is ongoing, and the firm hasn't received a formal report of claims against Jurvetson or other investors. So uh, a lot of questions, uh, not a lot of answers yet, but uh, we're going to continue to report out this story. Thank you so much, Ellen, for that update. All right, well, Uber is being sued by three engineers accusing the ride-hailing giant of discriminating against women and people of color. The three female plaintiffs say Uber pays women and people of color less than their peers and doesn't promote them as frequently as males, whites and Asians. They say the company is in violation of California's Private Attorneys General Act of 2004. Penalties under this act can amount to billions of dollars. Uber declined to comment about this lawsuit. Coming up, how to keep re-engineering success. Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella sat down with David Rubenstein to share his secrets. We'll hear some of that interview next. This is Bloomberg. Success brings an inevitable problem for companies, how to keep re-engineering it. Microsoft's CEO Satya Nadella was tasked with just that when he was tapped to lead their Bing and cloud teams. Here's what he told the Carlisle co-founder and co-CEO on the latest episode of The David Rubenstein Show. You're rising up in Microsoft, you're running the business solutions division at one point, but then they say to you, we'd like you to run the search business called Bing. And did you say, you can't compete against Google, I don't want to do that, or did you say, no, I'll happy to do that. <laughs> you know, it is, um, I had just um, uh, been promoted uh, to lead our business solutions um, uh, team and um, I, I mean I was, I was loving that job and something that I'd aspired to do and, um, and Steve comes around and he says, hey, you know what, I have an idea for you. I think you should go run this uh, group uh, that's got high attrition and we have a very tough task ahead. Uh, and I don't know whether it's a good career move, but uh, yeah, I need help and um, you know, think wisely and choose. <laughs> and, and I was like, wow, this is an interesting choice uh, in front of me. And I remember very distinctly um, you know, going that night uh, to the building in which uh, the Bing team and our search team was housed. Um, and it was what, maybe nine o'clock or so, and the parking lot was full, people were in. And I said, wow, what's, what's the deal here? I mean, these people are like working uh, and inspired. And, uh, and so I said, wow, I gotta join this team. I gotta, like the, the, the fight. Uh, that they showed uh, caused me to not take the easy path uh, and get in. Okay, well, did Steve say, if you do this well, we'll be happy. If you don't do it well, you might not get another job. That's did correct. And that was, you know, Steve was, one of the things that is amazing of both Bill and Steve is uh, their candor. <laughs> it's not like they sugarcoat anything. Uh, right. They're very, very honest about most things in life or everything in life. And they were sort of very clear, look, if you do a good job, maybe you will have another job. If not, you won't. <laughs> so you did a pretty good job, and then they came along and asked you to run another business which was not that competitive at the time, and that was your cloud computing business. How did it happen that Amazon, uh, which was not a computer company, more or less, became a giant in cloud, and Microsoft, right nearby, wasn't a, a, a giant there? The interesting thing is, what happens when a company becomes successful is this beautiful, virtuous cycle that gets created between your concept or product your capability and your culture, right? You really have all these three things fall into gear and they're working super well. But then what happens is the concept that made you successful runs out of gas. Uh, it's not growing anymore. You now need new capability 
And in order to have that new capability, you need a culture that allows you to grow that new capability, right? We, our server business was growing strong double digits. It was a high margin business. Uh, and you look around, uh, you know, uh, on the other side of the lake, uh, here is a very low margin business right. uh, called the cloud. And people will look at that and say, why would we do that? Uh, when we have such an amazing, fast-growing, uh, high-margin business. And that, I think, is the challenge. And so to be able to see these secular trends long before they become conventional wisdom, change your business model, change your technology, and change the product is the challenge of business. Uh, you know, in tech, it's unforgiving. But quite frankly, now that tech is part of every business, uh, I think all of us have to deal with it. And Rubenstein with Nadella discussed the issue of pay equity for women as well and what steps he is taking to address that challenge at Microsoft. Take a listen. Almost everything you've done since you've been CEO in the last three and a half years has worked perfectly. You know, the stock is up, the market value is up, everybody likes you. The only thing that I could find that anybody criticized you for was you gave a statement about women's uh, pay at one point, and you cor uh, correctly, um, I think, changed your position the next day, but can you explain what happened? Absolutely. I was asked about, uh, you know, pay equity. In fact, I, you know, I, I just gave such an absolute nonsensical answer, which um, Maria Clave, who was interviewing me, was kind enough to correct me while uh, I was on stage itself, because I was answering a question literally using some past, I mean, my own personal experience without understanding the broader context, the depth of that question, which is, what does a person like me, who is a CEO of a company, doing to make sure that one, women can fully participate uh, in our companies and in our economies. There is equal pay for equal work, and more importantly, there is equal opportunity for equal work. That was the real question. It was not about like, okay, what worked for you and what career advice do you have for me? Uh, it was a great learning moment for me. Uh, it's something that I've obviously uh, taken back. In fact, when I talk to women who are very close to me, work you know, very senior, very successful women uh, that are key to Microsoft and heard even their own personal experiences, that's when it's struck me how, you know, the job of a CEO in particular is to make sure that everyone, uh, whether it's gender diversity or ethnic diversity, can first come into the company, do their best work so that we can then serve right. our customers. So that's a re realization um, which right. I thought I had, quite frankly, uh, but I was, uh, I'm glad I messed up so publicly because I think I internalized the lessons from it. Did you hear uh, from your wife about that? Or absolutely. That? From At that time, my mom was alive for my mom and my wife. My wife had to give up her career because of our son, uh, but in my, even in my mom's case, uh, she struggled. She, in fact, uh, now I realize it a lot more than I even did obviously growing up, um, was the trade-off she had to make uh, where she, the, the system that she was working in did not support her re-entry into the workforce right. after uh, you know, she had uh, both my, myself and my sister. So you have um, about 125,000 employees, something like that. So uh, what percentage are male, what percentage are female, and how many senior women do you have? Technology is not a place where a lot of women have risen That's to the top a, uh, yet, yeah. uh, relatively speaking. In fact, one of the things that uh, we have made some good progress on is uh, on the women's representation, which we have a long way to go. I mean, you've got to remember that in tech, we have a particularly tougher issue because of our technology uh, disparity in terms of uh, gender diversity. But let's start with the progress, which is in the last year, we made um, We've gone from around, you know, we improved to 27.7% of women coming into the organization, which is around two points more than historical. Right. And in the technology side, uh, where we've improved uh, by four points. So that's, I would say, 
movement in the right direction, but not enough, obviously. One of the other things our board uh, also did was to change the compensation system for me as well as my direct reports uh, to say, look, numeric progress, besides all the work uh, that we may do, programs we may have, and the talk, let's even tie compensation of the senior most people, including the CEO, to real numerical progress. And so uh, we're doing everything, uh, but quite frankly, it's going to take continuous vigilance, continuous push, uh, and it's a top of mind issue for all of us. Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella there. You can watch the full episode of the David Rubenstein Show peer-to-peer -peer conversations with his guest this week, Nadella, 9 p.m. New York time. Coming up, Amazon has a new service that will let them into your home. The latest on the online retail giant steps to try and make sure you never miss a package. Next, this is Bloomberg. As we've been reporting, more than 200 cities are currently bidding to secure the location of Amazon's second headquarters. Real estate investor and Starwood Capital Group chairman and CEO Barry Sternlich spoke to Bloomberg's Eric Schatzker at the Future Investment Initiative in Riyadh and said he's betting on one city in particular. They create so much demand and cities are so excited to have So them. far, they're not building their own buildings. Yeah. No, they don't want it on their balance sheet, but they, are, they do on their own distribution centers. So. I'm uh, not clear why. I guess they can't do everything, even though it looks like they're trying to do everything. Um, yeah, I think Boston has a pretty good shot at that, given that it's as far away in the technology mm -hmm. and the infrastructure and the educational base and just the zeitgeist of the city. So we'll see how that turns out. The other places you would think they might go are the southeast. Atlanta. Raleigh, Durham, mm -hmm. Atlanta, places with a good industry technology. Atlanta is very affordable. Transportation hub. Transportation hub. In other Amazon news, the online retail giant wants to make missed deliveries a thing of the past. The new service, dubbed Amazon Key, will let Amazon deliver packages directly into your home. It will also let selected services like house cleaners and dog walkers in while you're away. The service works with an electronic lock and security camera that will film the person entering your home. Joining me now to discuss, Mark Gurman, who covered the story for Bloomberg. So, how does this fit into Amazon's hardware strategy? Yeah, it's interesting. It seems like every other week we're here talking about a new Echo, a new Fire TV, a new tablet, whatever. Now it's security cameras. It's a hot space right now. Nest came out with theirs. Everyone is coming out with a security system now for the home. This is Amazon's approach, and they're tying it directly into how they make money. Packages, right? People buy stuff online. Now this is just another tool that Amazon is selling to help people get their stuff. So this would literally be a package delivery person entering your home. Right? Right. What about security concerns? You know, it's interesting. We haven't heard back from them yet about if Amazon has some insurance program or the liability or the terms of service that a user has to agree to. Are you waiving your right to, you know, sue Amazon or file a complaint if something goes wrong? I'm sure that the people are vetted and there's never, I mean, they hope they won't be a circumstance like that, but the reality is letting a person into your home, which is a sacred place for many, is not an easy thing. So how do they convince people that this is worth it? Well, there's two things. In terms of buying the hardware, I think it's you know a no-brainer purchase. If you look at the specs on this thing, the video quality that it records, the app integration, it's actually 120 bucks, which is a really good price. That's about half the price of some of the closest competitors from Nest and other smart home camera makers. So from that perspective, I think it's a cool product. But in terms of the Amazon key, letting people into your home aspect of the service, I think that's a tougher sell for now. So how does this fit in with all of the other, well, fit in with the Echo uh, and other home-based devices? Right. I mean, all of Amazon's devices are designed to sell you more stuff from Amazon, whether that's buying stuff with your voice. Now this is another conduit, another element of that system of people buying things and now having a security camera. They're also going to be selling a subscription service for cloud storage of the video recordings. So that's another way they're going to make money from this too. Um, you know, and, and how does this fit into the broader delivery efforts in general? Obviously, Amazon is trying to take on more of that, you know, delivery logistics problem, you know, take it, taking it away from UPS and away from FedEx. Right, this is another element to it, and Amazon is getting some more competition lately. I mean, there was a time where you couldn't think of anyone other than Amazon as where you were going to buy your stuff. Now there's Walmart. Walmart's a big competitor, and they've actually announced a similar service. Now Amazon is fighting back with a little bit more of an integrated approach, the integration with smart locks, the integration with their new 
uh, cloud camera tech as well. So what are you going to be watching as we head into the holidays and all of the stuff converges at once? It's going to be interesting to see how the different companies create their platforms as a way to lock people into their ecosystem. It's, it's going to be interesting to see if there's going to be some people who are going to buy some Apple devices, some Google, some Nest, some Amazon. And I think that the competition is going to heat up and you're going to see everyone trying to get a piece of every different device. What's the hottest speaker on the market? What do you think? What's Mark's on the Gurman, what Mark, Mark Gurman's recommendation? Well, actually, stay tuned to Gadgets with Gurman. Right. Here's my plug. We're going to be comparing all the hottest news, Sonos One, the HomePod, everything down the road. Uh, I've been listening to the Sonos One at home for the last few weeks. That's the one. It's a Sonos speaker with Alexa. It actually sounds really good. So stay tuned to more on that. All right. Mark Gurman, our consumer tech reporter, thank you so much Thanks. for stopping by. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Tech earnings will be in full swing Thursday. Twitter, Amazon, Alphabet, Microsoft, and Intel, just a few of the companies reporting, will have full coverage and analysis. And a reminder, we're live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. That is all for now. This is Bloomberg.